Welcome back, geology fans. Anyone with kids knows that 9 out of 10 times when you explain a why question to them, they'll just ask why the explanation. And so we should in science. We've said over the last few episodes that continental drift was best explained by plate tectonics, which is driven by the mechanism of seafloor spreading. Today we try to get the fundamentals of why seafloor spreading. If you followed the series, you already know there are heavy elements within our planet that break apart through nuclear fission and release heat energy within the Earth. A majority of this heat is released within the Earth's more fluid mantle below the lithosphere, which we call the asthenosphere. Like a pot of water on a stove being heated from below, the asthenosphere rolls over, transferring the heat toward the surface through convection. Where these convection currents in the asthenosphere rise up to the base of the lithosphere, which we recall as the crust and uppermost rigid mantle, the current spreads apart to complete the upper part of the convection cell. This is where mid-ocean ridges form, producing the mafic magma to make basaltic injections and volcanoes in and on the crust. The divergent motion of the convection cells below the ridges is an obvious explanation for seafloor spreading. So we can rephrase this convection of the asthenosphere mechanism for seafloor spreading as the conveyor belt mechanism. It's like the conveyor belt at the grocery store in which the lithospheric groceries ride atop the conveyor belt asthenosphere. The uplifted ridge itself is formed by the upwelling motion, less dense earth below, and less dense heated lithosphere. As new ocean crust moves away from the ridge, it cools, thus contracting and getting denser, and leaves that upwelling portion of the mantle, and so sinks a few kilometers to the more common seafloor elevation of four to five kilometers below the surface. Because ridges maintain these sloped flanks, dipping away from their center, a second driving force can be brought into play, that being the fundamental force of gravity. Well, gravity with a twist, as it were. Here we do a bit of classic physics. A mass is pulled on by the force of gravity to give it weight, which is a force. Standing or sitting, you feel the force of your mutual gravity with the Earth. Pick up a rock and drop it, and you see you get motion, accelerated motion, when the resistance to that force is removed. But if I take that rock and put it on a sloped surface, something happens to our gravitational force. Tilt, no motion, tilt far enough, and we see that motion again, but this time down and to the side. When analyzing this problem, we diagram out the scene and put in what we know, but don't see. We know gravity pulls straight down towards the Earth, and it's equal to the mass of the rock times the vector of gravitational acceleration. Now, let me unpack that. When I say vector, I mean something that has not only a number value, but a direction as well. The mass is what we call a scalar. It only has a number value, but no direction. When we multiply mass times gravity, a scalar times a vector, the result is another vector, the force due to gravity in the direction of the line connecting the centers of mass. But now we find a portion of that force is pushing the block down into the slope surface to keep it from moving. So we draw an arrow down from the center of mass perpendicular to our slope, far enough to make a right angle with our original force line. We also know that if we tilt our slope steep enough, the block will begin to move. So there must be a force that is in that direction to make it move. Draw a line out from the center of mass parallel to the slope far enough to make a right angle with the original force line, and we have this box. A little geometry shows that the angle of the slope is also the angle between the principal gravity and the component pushing down into the slope, which we call the normal force. The other component is called the shear force, and is there even when the block isn't moving. There is just one other force, called frictional force, in the exact opposite direction, and it builds as the shear force builds. If shear force gets greater than frictional force, static frictional force to be exact, we get movement, with the shear force winning over the now kinetic frictional force. Now, look at the shape of a mid-ocean ridge again, and realize there is a shear force constantly on the internal mass of the lithospheric plate pushing outward from the central high ridge year in, year out, night and day. This second mechanism to drive seafloor spreading has been called ridge push or gravity sliding. 
Ridge push actually has one other component, which is that cooling and contracting of the lithosphere as it draws away from the ridge, which causes a little bit more tension on the ridge, pulling it apart. The last mechanism identified to drive seafloor spreading, and thus plate tectonics, involves those subduction zones at the trenches of destruction. We create at the ridges and destroy at the trenches through subduction, in which ocean lithosphere dives below an overriding plate where the two meet. In episode 39 on pressure and temperature, we pointed out that these subduction zones have one of the shallowest geothermal gradients, and that it can cross the solidus of the lighter minerals going down to produce magma. Meanwhile, the pressure still builds up significantly with depth, so as a slab of subducting plate goes down, it loses the less dense material to magma, and its more dense minerals begin to undergo phase changes to become even more dense in response to increasing pressure. In the end, it's our old friend gravity that is going to do the work here. If I take a stack of papers and place them hanging off the edge of the table, I can simulate a subduction zone. As I subduct the paper stack, there comes a point where I don't need to push anymore. The leading edge of the stack was pulling with a normal and sheer force again and dragging the rest of the stack down with it. To complete the analogy, imagine if, as the papers went over the edge, they got denser and denser, thus pulling harder and harder on the rest of the slab behind. This final mechanism is called slab pull. And it has been noted that the older the ocean lithosphere is subducting, and the longer the subduction zones, the faster these tectonic plates tend to go. Using hotspots and modern satellites, we know the relative speeds of the Earth's tectonic plates and see these fastest plates connected to very substantial subduction zones. So clearly slab pull is an important driving force. Though we also see plates that don't have substantial subduction zones, and they move as well, so clearly you need those other driving forces we started with of asthenosphere conveyor belt and gravity sliding. We should note that big whirls have smaller whirls, and we're not sure if we have a single cell or double cell generally in the convecting asthenosphere. But when these subducting slabs are affected by slab pull, the mantle below gives resistance and begins to flow, causing stresses on the lithosphere above. It is common to see extension pulling apart in what is known as the back arc basin of the overriding plate. For a continent, the land approaching the plate boundary is getting a mini conveyor belt pull back towards the trench. and This is called trench suction. To recap, our big three mechanisms to drive seafloor spreading, and thus plate tectonics with their attached drifting continents, are conveyor belt motion of the asthenosphere, driven by radioactive decay adding heat to the interior of the Earth, gravity sliding, also known as ridge push, aided by contraction of the slab as it leaves the ridges, and slab pull as the subducting ocean lithosphere gets progressively denser with depth, with a slab pull seeming to pull a majority of the weight in driving plate tectonics. But there are plenty of mysteries left to solve in plate tectonics, including its more deep-time history and prevalence on other planetary bodies, which will be the subject of our next episode, here on Earth Explorations. <laughs>